Deuteronomy chapter number 30 for our text tonight, if you'll find your place. Deuteronomy chapter number 30. I'm glad that God, I'm glad that God does exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think. Amen? Amen. Above all we could ask, and our own personal pride will keep us from asking for those things that are above our degree, I guess, for lack of a better word. But he said not only, not only the things we could ask, but he said he could do above what we could even think. I'm grateful that we serve such a God as this. Amen? Amen. Good to see you back out on Sunday evening. Appreciate the good presence of the Lord in the service this morning. He helped us, and I appreciate the good help from the Lord in the service this morning. Deuteronomy 30, and we'll pick up our reading tonight in verse number 15 and read down through the end of this chapter. <clears throat> Trust in the Lord will help us as we look into the Word of God together tonight. Here's what the Bible said. The Bible said, see, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil, in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, and that the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land, whether thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away so that thou will not hear, shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land where thou passest over Jordan to possess it, to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, Therefore, choose life that, thou, uh, that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life, and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. I'll finish reading there in verse number 20. I, I really want to focus, if the Lord will help us tonight, on verse number 20. This last verse that I've read, the children of Israel have reached a place where they are soon to cross over into the promised land. But if they're going to go over into that land and they're going to possess it and they're going to prosper in it, there's some decisions that they're going to have to make. That brings me to a thought. There are lots of folks in the Christian experience that possess the Christian life. That is, that they are saved by the grace of God, but they never prosper in the Christian life. They've reached that place where they made a profession of faith, where they accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, where they repented of their sins and believed and called and found that peace and assurance in their soul. But that's as far as they went. I want you to understand something tonight. There is a place of real prosperity in this Christian experience. Amen? You can have more, and, 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 and some would be critical when I make that statement, but you can have more than a passing salvation experience. Now, I understand it's eternal. It'll hold forever. I get that. But I want you to know something, that every day of your life you can live the fullness of the Christian life but only if you make the right decisions, amen? If I had a thought tonight, I'm looking at verse number 19, and the Bible said, I call heaven and earth to record a record this day against you, that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, and then the writer Moses said, Therefore, choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. And I, I want to use that thought tonight. I guess if I had a, 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 a primary title for what I want to share with you, I would, I would entitle my thoughts tonight this, choose well. Choose well. There is a choice that each of us as believers must make on a continual basis. And I mean by that, we make it daily, we make it weekly, we make it annually, amen. There is a perpetual choice 
that must be made in the life of the believers. God said, I have set before you life and death. I have given you the option of blessings or cursings. And he seems to say to you and I, you ought to choose well. Amen. You need to choose well. Let me give you three ways or three thoughts by introduction this afternoon. And then I'll deal with one thought in the context of the message. Number one, I think it would do us well this evening if we contemplated that the seriousness of this decision. The choice that is set before us is a serious decision. Look at the first phrase of verse number 19. The Bible said, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. Have you ever considered this? The Lord is saying to you and I in the context of verse number 19 that the way we live our Christian lives Will, be a, will have an impact, will have an effect, if you will, both in heaven and in earth. The choice that we're making is going to decide how we will be rewarded in heaven and in earth. I fear that a lot of times we approach spiritual decisions like we approach our natural decisions. Some of you ladies stood at the door of your closet in your bedroom this morning and spend a long time deciding on dress one or dress two. Is it going to be blue or bluer? I'm getting in trouble right there, amen. Well, the ultimate reality is that next Sunday, you'll stand at that same closet door and you'll ask yourself the question, what did I wear last Sunday? Because you will not remember, I had a pastor friend in Northwest Georgia and his wife said to me, her name was Danita, and she said, I want you to know that Bruce is so, he is so controlling in his thought process that he has his suits and his ties set up on a rotation. And if you open his closet, you will know that the suit he's going to wear this Sunday is on this end of the closet. And when he takes it off and he, and he puts it back on the hanger, he moves it over to this end of the closet so that he's continually rotating through. I thought, my goodness, I preach every night and it'll be a difficult thing for me to remember what I wore tonight, tomorrow night. <laughs> Amen. I guess what I'm saying to you is that that's a natural decision. It has a temporal impact and tomorrow you won't remember it and it won't have any effect on tomorrow. But what about eternal decisions? Now, I'm not even talking about Salvation, although certainly that does have an impact. We ought to make the right choice when it comes to being saved by the grace of God. But I'm dealing with the fact that as a believer, every day we are confronted with eternal decisions. And notice that the record affects two places. There is the effect on earth, and there will be an impact on your life as you choose to walk with God, as you choose to be in fellowship with God, as you choose to be obedient to God, as you choose to yield yourself to God, it will impact you on a daily basis. It'll affect your life on earth. By the way, it'll affect your life in heaven. Amen? There will be a reckoning day when God will call us into judgment for the resources, the opportunities that he afforded us in our Christian life and whether or not we acted upon them or whether or not we failed to act upon them. Choose well. It's a serious decision. Now I want to put a little subnote on this and remind you of what the scripture said at the conclusion of verse number 20, or verse number 19. It not only will be recorded in heaven and recorded in earth, it will impact your life on earth and it will impact your eternity in heaven. But you'll notice at the end of verse number 19, there is a solemn reminder that it's not a decision that only impacts you. One man has wisely said, no man lives unto himself alone. And that is no, there is no place other where that is more true than it is in the Christian life. Sir, you will affect not only yourself, but your family. The choice that you make, the decision that you make, 
it's not only going to impact you, but it'll impact your wife. It'll impact your children. And potentially, if God allows you to live long enough, it'll impact your children's children. And there'll be remembrance generation after generation. And because you chose well, there is a seriousness to this decision. Then number two, again, I'm just dealing with the introduction. Stay with me. Not only does the text remind us that this is a serious decision, but I'm also reminded that it is a sobering decision. He said, I have set before you life and death. If the doctor walks into you in your exam tomorrow, if you're at, the, uh, at his office or perhaps you're at the clinic or down at the hospital, and you've had a test run or you're treated for some difficulty or some disease or some problem and the doctor walks in and he said to you, this is a life and death matter. That sobers us. That's not something that we're just going to pass by. He's got your attention. Amen. I, I, had, a, I had a family physician and a dear friend that attended, uh, visited the same doctor. His name was, the doctor's name was Cohen. And, uh, and Bill Bowers attended the same doctor. Bill Bowers went in and, and, and for several uh, checkups and appointments, Bill was my friend. He had had a significant cholesterol problem. And when I say significant, his numbers exceeded the thousand mark. But Dr. Cohen said, I never could get Bill's attention. And so one day he walked in, and this is what he said to Bill Bowers. He said, Bill Bowers, I want to take out a life insurance policy on you. That got Bill's attention. If the doctor's willing to take his money and buy a life insurance policy, he has no great expectation that you're going to make it very much longer. Amen. This is a serious matter because it affects heaven and earth. It affects your family. It affects your relationships. It affects your own life. But it's a sobering matter because the ultimate result will be whether you are dead or alive. It's a life and death matter. And I know people today that are saved, I believe they're saved, they can give you a clear testimony of their salvation, but to be honest about it, they are dead while they live. Their lives are surrounded by bitterness and anger and confusion, and they have no contentment, they enjoy no peace. Why? Because they made the wrong decisions spiritually. It's a serious matter. It's a sobering matter. It's also a matter that will bring uh, reward with success. The Bible reminds us in the end of verse number 20 that if we make the right choice, if we choose well, then we are blessed with three things. One, he said we'll be given life because he is our life. <laughs> Let me say that again. We'll be given life because he is our life. Why would we attempt to live on our own abilities when we have the capacity to live on his ability. Amen. 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 We can draw our strength not from what we know or what we can do or how we can satisfy our flesh, but we can draw our strength from our relationship with the Lord of heaven. He said if you'll make the right choice, if you'll choose well, you'll have a life worth living. There'll be abundant living. Amen. Number two, he said a life that's chosen well or a walk that's chosen well will not only bring life, but it'll bring length of days. Now, I don't know if that implies that there will be a longevity of the human sense or the physical sense there perhaps could be, but I believe God is saying to us that there'll be a spiritual longevity in our lives. Amen. We'll have something that'll be good tomorrow. I don't know about you, I hope you won't think I'm very morbid when I say this. But I guess as I stand in my own immortality and my own mortality, I look down the road at the years that lie ahead of me if the Lord does not come back. And I fear one thing above all else. I don't want to become an old, bitter soul. I've known a few of them. Amen. I think about Dr. Thompson and what time I've spent at his table and seated beside him, and there's such a meekness and a sweet spirit about him. And uh, man, I'm telling you, and yet I've sat with others 
that are cantankerous <laughs> and they're mean and they're bitter and I think that perhaps there is something to be said about the choices that they have made spiritually. I want to choose the right thing, don't you? I want to choose well. I do not want to look back and here's why they're bitter. Here's why they're angry. Here's why they live the way they live in those latter years. They look back at their younger years and they despise them. They're constantly living a life of regret of what they did not do or what they could have done or the way things could have been uh, simply because they did not choose well spiritually. Wow. Then he said, number three, that there'll be the land. He said, you'll go up and possess the land. And this is what he said. Here's where I, I love this phrase. Look at it. He said, thou mayest dwell in the land. Isn't that interesting? You see, the land was already theirs. I know you wouldn't have got them to agree to that statement that day, but God had apportioned Israel that piece of property a long time before this crowd ever stood in the wilderness of Sinai. Amen. When Abraham's feet walked the perimeters of what we know as the possession of Israel, when Abraham walked it, God said, it's yours, and they owned the land. The land was theirs. It was their possession. It was available to them. I know it had giants. I know there were battles that had to be fought and burdens that had to be carried and buildings that had to be built. I understand those things. But may I say to you, it was theirs. God had already deeded them their inheritance. But it was yet to be determined whether they would go up to and dwell in it. Amen. When you got saved by the grace of God, God deeded you an inheritance. Amen. 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 He did. Yeah. In fact, I could prove that to you out of the first chapter of the book of Ephesians where the Bible said that the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost of God is the earnest of our inheritance. It's just the outer edge. It's the down payment on what God has already assigned to us. It's yours. But what I find in the Christian walk is that such a small number of individuals ever choose well enough to dwell in the land that God has given them in the first place. It is yours to dwell in, but you must go up and possess it. Amen? Only those that choose well. And so I want to deal with, and I have a subtitle to these limited thoughts tonight, the text is that we need to choose well, but the subtitle to these thoughts is this, how to have a life that's a blessing. How to have a life that is a blessing. Now you say, Brother Moore, why do you word it that way? Because the Bible did. The Bible said I set before you a blessing or a curse. Hmm? How many people do you know that reach the end of their days, they come to the conclusion of their walk and they look back at a life of regret rather than a life of blessing. God said it doesn't have to be that way. You can have this life of blessing. Now notice my choice of words and I may get my tongue tangled up as I continue to preach tonight and I might let an S get attached to that word and if I do, I apologize in advance. It's human nature. Sometimes we're a lot more interested in the blessings than we are the blessing. And I mean by that we become overwhelmed by our desire for the tangible things. That is, the things we can lay hands on and the things we can touch. But I do not believe that the context of this opportunity that Israel has before them a blessing or a cursing. It doesn't have anything at all to do with the physical things. It's not dealing with the land that flows with milk and honey or the corn that they did not harvest or the vineyards that they did not plant. Those are theirs for the possession. What it deals with is the spiritual things. And I say to you today that there is a choice that must be made in our lives every day whether or not we will choose the things of God which bring blessing, a life that is a blessing, or rather we choose the carnal things and we pursue the fleshly things. If we sow to the flesh, 
We'll of the same flesh reap corruption. But if we sow to the Spirit, we'll of the Spirit reap life everlasting. There is a choice that must be made. And the Scripture says, choose well. In this congregation tonight, I, I preach to a vast host of folks. There's young children in here that have the entirety of their day spread out before them, and many of them have accepted Christ. Hallelujah! Now it is our duty and obligation and opportunity as parents and pastors and church family to help guide them and develop them so that they make the right choices. Amen. 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 We want them to choose well because they, they can have a life that is a spiritual blessing. There's young families in this church, couples united in matrimony, but just months, not even able hardly to measure in, 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 in years yet. And, 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 and they have so much opportunity ahead of them. They have so much potential ahead of them, young men and young ladies. And God said today, I set again before you a blessing and a curse. Which will you choose? If you choose the flesh, you'll take the curse. And you'll look back at the spiritual neglect of your life. But if you choose the spiritual, you'll receive the blessing. Oh, how blessed it is. Make the right choice. Choose well. Middle-aged individuals who are looking at their empty nester years and, 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 and they've got plans for their future. Choose well. Because the choice that you make, the decision that you embrace will determine whether it's a blessing or a curse. Seniors with silver hair that stand in the latter days of their passings and, and they look back at their yesterdays that cannot be changed. Do not forget that you're not in the grave yet. That you've still got a tomorrow. And if God gives you a tomorrow, choose well. Choose well. Choose the spiritual things so that your life will be a blessing. Now, let me show you from the scriptures three truths in the text that God pins for you and I about how to have that blessed life. Here they are. You'll find them in verse number 20. Number one, he deals with our affections. Love the Lord thy God. Let me say that again. It needs to be repeated. Love the Lord thy God. What are you in love with today? Amen. This is a blunt conversation. What are you in love with? If you want a blessed life, then fall in love with the Lord thy God. What is your seat of affection? That's the question on the table. What do you love more than anything else? I see Peter standing with a resurrected Christ. I see Peter standing and hearing the Lord say, do you love me, Peter? And he said, yea, Lord, I love you. And God said, feed my sheep. Much to Peter's dismay, the question came back again. Do you love me? <laughs> And Peter said, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, feed my lambs. Peter thought the inquiry, probably at that moment, what he thought was an interrogation had passed. But oh, Peter heard the Lord say one more time, Peter, do you love me? And with a humbled spirit and tear-filled eyes, Peter said, yeah, Lord, I love you. You know I love you. You know I love you. And the Lord said, prove your love for me <laughs> by what you do, feed my lambs. Now it's been argued that Peter denied the Lord three times, therefore he was called to profess the Lord three times. I do not know. I know the scholars tell us that there's different attributes of the idea of love that are mentioned in that passage. I, I, I'm certain that's so. I saw it in, I saw it in the, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, lexicon. Amen? I, I saw it. But I do know one thing three times in his life, Peter was called upon to make a profession of how much he loved the Lord. 
And you and I will be called upon to speak about our affection. What are you in love with? I'm going to be honest with you. Turn the book of Colossians chapter number three. I'm dealing with this subject of affection. I'll deal with it quickly. In Colossians chapter number three. I feel like the Lord's give us a groove. I want to preach a little bit. Colossians. Colossians chapter number three. Now I'm reminded by the context of this passage that God is not speaking to the unsaved man. But rather he is speaking to the believer. He's speaking to the one that has been saved. You'll see that in verse number one of chapter number three. I'm in Colossians three in verse number one. If ye then be risen with Christ. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the one that has been born again. Raised to walk in the newness of life. Verse 20 of chapter two talks about being dead with Christ. Chapter three verse one talks about being risen with Christ. Notice the expression in verse number one of chapter three. Seek those things which are above. Wow. Seek. That's an interesting terminology and we could linger a long time here, but the Holy Ghost is gonna keep it limited. Seek. Can I say this, Brother Brian? That's not a passive term. It's an active phrase. Are you with me? Fellowship Baptist Church, having a blessed life does not just happen. It will not fall into your lap. Amen? You look at men or women that you admire in the church or outside of the church, I'm talking spiritually minded. You look at people in the faith that you you, you admire and you, you yearn to be like or wish that you could have the walk with God that they seem to have. And yet we fail to see that there was a place and a time in their lives where they laid aside some other ambitions and some other drives and chose to embrace none other than the Lord himself. What are you in love with? It's 2019. I'm going to have to find a new illustration because we live in a weird day. But 20 years ago, I would have strained it something like this. If I were to ask, in fact, I only know of one personal illustration. So I say personal. I, I, I knew one couple. <laughs> the reality is that if I were to ask this morning or this evening, if I were to say this evening, um, concerning you and your companion, your spouse, sir, your wife, how many of you, how many of you were pursued by her? They're real quiet, preacher. You'd say, no! I had to win her! I had to pursue her! I had to seek her. That's what it's supposed to be, isn't it? Somebody say amen. Y'all y'all act like I just introduced a new doctrine. <laughs> amen. <laughs> oh, yeah. Y'all don't know where I'm going, so you're afraid to answer because you're afraid you're going to get yourself in trouble. Amen. Oh, no. You saw her. You decided that's the one I want to have a part in my life. That's the one I want to be near to. That's the one I want to love. That's the one I want to live with. And what did you do? You began to seek her. You began to search for her. You went out and, and, and began to pursue her. And, and, and you did that because you loved her. And the Bible asks us the question, are we passively just sitting there? I've just got a strange feeling, Brother David, since you're on the front row, that you just didn't sit on the church pew and wait on Meredith to come over and sit beside you. It didn't happen that way. It didn't come that way. You went and got her. And yet we live our Christian lives thinking that if we just sit on the church pew, if we just fill our chair, that somehow, some way, it's going to be a spiritual experience. And God is going to suddenly show up 
It won't work that way. You've got to seek after things above. You've got to look for opportunities to draw closer to God. Amen. 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 My friend Tim McCulley pastors the Philadelphia Baptist Church. Amen. Brother McCulley said, Brother McCulley said, when he met Deborah, his wife now of 30 years, I guess, when he met Deborah, she was engaged to another young man. <laughs> and he fell in love with her, head over heels, first look, first love, all that, I don't know. I, wa I wasn't around in that relationship, but, but I was around. But I, he said, he said, what my friend said, Tio, you can't pursue her. She's not going to talk to you. She's not going to be your girlfriend. She's engaged to somebody else. And he said, she's not married yet. <laughs> well, I guess I've already gave the punchline away. Y'all can figure out the end of the story. Amen. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying he went for something because he was in love with it. Are you seeking out opportunities to get closer to God or just hoping that by attending church you'll be where he wants you to be? Number one, he said seek. And then number two, I want you to read in verse number two. I'm still in Colossians chapter number three. Here's how the word of God lays it out. Number one, you'll have to seek things that are above. Number two, he said you'll have to set your affections on things that are above. Let's read it. He said for you're dead. I'm sorry, I'm one verse ahead. He said, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. Now we begin to see the distinction, do we not? He reminded us in verse number one, Brother Merriman, he reminded us that Christ is in heaven that Christ is above, that we ought to be looking above because that's where Christ is. And then he said in verse number two, avoid those things on the earth. We're ever drawn between two worlds, my friend. We're ever drawn to satisfy the carnal, to satisfy the physical, and we're ever drawn to please the Lord. Paul defined that in the seventh chapter of the book of Romans as being a wretched man living in a body of death. But he did say there is a victory and that victory is in the Lord Jesus Christ. I've often said this, if I use this context in a missions meeting, here's what I'll ask folks. I said, I'm not asking you to do it, but if you give me your checkbook or in this modern era, your debit records for the last 60 days, I'll tell you what you're in love with. I'll tell you what the priorities of your life are. I'll tell, I'll tell you what's preeminent in your living. Amen. God help us to set our affections on things up there. To seek after those things that are above. How am I going to do that? Because I'm constantly drawn below. He gave the answer to that in verse number five. He said, mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. That word mortify is a difficult word. It comes from the same word we get the word mortician. It means something has got to die. I'd like to keep my S's in my simple alliteration. He said, seek some things, set some things. And then he said, slay some things. Hey, you know what's holding you back? Your allurement to the world. Don't get embarrassed, ma'am. Don't get embarrassed, sir. The man beside you and the woman beside you fights the same battles that you fight. The question is, will you choose well today? He said, love the Lord. Check your affections. Are you more in love with the world than you are with the things of God? If you are, you better cut something off. Amen? If it's an offense to you, you better pluck out your eye and cut off your head. You better slay something in your life because it's more important that you choose well. Number two, he said, and I'm back in Deuteronomy now. I'm sorry to make you jump around. Deuteronomy chapter 30, he said in verse number 20, 
love the Lord thy God. And then he said, obey his voice. (laughs) Now what I'm about to say should be an elementary statement, but it's so complicated for the average believer. And in this modern era, we found grace. No, what you found is grace that you made into lasciviousness. Say amen right there. That's exactly right. Is that the book of Jude, Brother David? I think it is. They turned the grace of God into lasciviousness. They said in their heart, they convinced themselves that because God was gracious and merciful and loved them, they could satisfy the ungodly nature of their flesh for their own satisfaction. You say, preacher, is that going on today? It's going on more than you'd ever imagine. Churches don't have a standard anymore. Nobody stands for anything. People dress as they choose. They walk as they choose. They do as they choose. And if you confront them, even with biblical context, they look at you and say, oh, but I found grace. Well, the grace I found said, if sin abounded and grace much more abounded, should we continue in sin? And God gave the answer, God forbid. The grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness, not to walk in it. Somebody help me and say amen right there. Don't come claiming grace. I'll tell you what grace will do. Grace will patch up the wounds when you cut something off. Amen. Amen. Grace will give you the courage and strength to go ahead and sever that earthly member that so distracts you from the walk that you need with God. As sure as I'm preaching tonight. So he says to us, not only do we need to have our affections right in verse number 20, but he said we have to have our actions right. We got to obey his voice. Now, we walk out of this text, and I want you to go to John 14, women. We'll chase this rabbit quickly. And we have a clear understanding. I do not believe that we could argue the context. Love the Lord thy God. Everybody okay with that? (laughs) Love him, love him. And we often say, I do, I do, I do, but you do not. How do you know? Because John 14 is in the Bible. In verse number 15, I'm in John 14, verse number 15. He said, if you love me, there we go. You just said you do. You just declared, I love the Lord, preacher. I've chosen well, I'm in love with God. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. What? The evidence of how much we love him is our obedience. Am I right? The evidence of our love is our obedience. We need to deal with our affection, make the right choice, choose well in our affection, love the Lord. Then we need to choose right in our actions. He said, obey his voice. Give me, I want to give you three thoughts. Number one, there's an action that's required. Keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. He gave us a record. He gave us a book. And what he wants us to do is not to excuse ourselves from the book, but to obey the book. Amen. Amen. God said do, then do. God said don't, then don't. Why? Because we love him. Remember the story of the little girl. I say little, but of course she was of courting age. The story's told about a young lady and uh, she had a date and was invited to a party a get together of some sort at a friend's house and her date picked her up and they went to that little party. There was a lot of young people there and in the course of that evening they decided that they would slip out of the party and go down to the county line, cross the county line where the honky-tonk was and they'd slip in and they'd drink a while and they'd dance a while. And as they sat there, the little girl said to her date, she said, would you take me home, please? She didn't say it loudly or disrespectfully. She just asked that he take her home. But the friends that were gathered around or the other young people that were gathered around heard that conversation and they began to taunt her. They began to tease her. And one of them said this, are you afraid your daddy's gonna hurt you if he finds out? Tears began to roll down the little girl's face and she said to those that were seated near her, oh no, 
She said, I'm not afraid if my daddy finds out that he'll hurt me. She said, I'm afraid if my daddy finds out it'll hurt him. Amen. It'll impact him. Oh, that we would live our lives not with the fear of God's judgment, but with the understanding of his disappointment. Somebody said, somebody said of Peter, the only preaching he ever needed was when the Lord looked at him. He stood warming himself by the devil's fire, cursing like a sailor, and ultimately denied the Lord. And when he did, that cock crew as God had said that he would, the Lord Jesus just looked at him, and one look out of those loving eyes was all the preaching that Peter needed. And he went out and wept bitter. Oh, if you and I could get in love with him so much tonight that it hurt us to hurt him. <laughs> to disappoint him. To let him down. There's an action that is required. You've got to love the Lord your God. You've got to keep his commandments. You've got to obey his voice. Let me hurry. I can linger there. But number two, I'm still in John 14. I hope you're there. Because can I, can I give you a little, can I give you a little thought out of the Bible? You and I understand. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not correct in a Bible. It needs no correction. But if you're a student of the Bible, you understand that Scripture references, chapters, verses, were added later. They not in the original. And I thank God for them. It'd be hard to say. Y'all go about halfway the book of John, three quarters way down the page, okay? I'm grateful for the references. And I believe they had a purpose. But sometimes to get the full context of a passage, you and I both know you have to go back into the previous chapter or back into the previous verse, study the punctuation, or read forward into another chapter. We understand that. <laughs> In the New Testament, particularly, they added paragraph markers. And the intent of those markers is to give us a thought process. The, the thought is changing. And at the beginning of the verse that I just read, verse number 15, there's one of those paragraph markers. If you love me, keep my commandments. And, 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 and the translators supplied us with a paragraph marker, modern English and indention. <laughs> and they said, there's a new thought. Well, for years, I looked at that context and said, I think they missed that one. And I know y'all ain't never done that. But I said, where's the connection with verse number 15 and verse number 16? Verse 16 is the one I like. That's the Holy Ghost chapter, or Holy Ghost verse. I'll send you a comforter. I'll pray the Father. I'll send the Spirit of truth. And the Holy Ghost looked at me one day and reminded me and said, you need to read that again. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I said, I know, Lord, that bothers me. And he said, I knew it would. He said, I knew the action that I required of you was going to be a difficult action because you're torn between two worlds. You are drawn spiritually while you are drawn physically. The flesh goes in one direction and the spirit in another. There's a war that goes on every day. And the Lord said, I knew it. He said, it's not an improper thought because you're standing in verse number 15 saying, how? Lord, you know I love you. I feel like Peter standing on the banks of that sea. You know I love you. You know it. And the Lord said, obey my voice. Keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. And in your mind, you're asking yourself the question, how can I do that today? How can I do that? How can I resist the temptation? How can I walk the way I'm supposed to walk? And he said, I got this. <laughs> Let me pray for you. And he said, I'm going to ask the Father to send you a comforter. Hallelujah. Amen. And he said, there's going to be somebody come into your life. And that somebody is none other than the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of truth. And he said, I'm going to ask the Father to send you a comforter. That word comforter seems to say somebody that will console you, somebody that will encourage you, somebody that will put your mind at ease. 
And so while you're wringing your hands wondering how in the world can I keep his commandments to prove how much I love him, the comforter walks by and said, let me help you. Amen. Amen. You can't do it by yourself, but I can do it for you. And it is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Galatians 2.20, I quoted it this morning. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. Christ liveth in me, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, I'm hurried. If we're going to be, in, if our actions are going to be right, there's an action that's required. We must keep his commandments. But then there's an assistance that's supplied the Holy Ghost. And oh, just for the fullness of the record, okay? This Holy Ghost is going to do something for the New Testament believer that was never offered to an Old Testament saint. He's moving in. Mm. Why does that matter? Because he's the strong man. Amen. He, he's going to take up his abode. In John 14, he was not abiding in the believers. But Jesus made a promise in verse number 17. He said, he dwelleth with you and he shall be in you. He's moving in. He's taking up residence. By the way, read the rest of the text. I don't have time. Verse 18, Jesus said, I'm moving in. Amen. Verse number 20, the father's moving in. <laughs> You say, how in the world can I prove my love by obeying his voice? The Holy Ghost, the assistance that's supplied. Let me give you a third truth in the text. Number one, there's an action required. Number two, there's assistance supplied. Number three, there's an approach that's identified. There's an approach that's identified. What is he going to do? You see, he continues to repeat himself in this. Verse 21, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Verse number 23, he said, Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words. Wow. How in the world are we going to do that? When the Holy Ghost moves in, look at verse number 26. He's going to teach you. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. Thank God for the ministry of the Holy Ghost to take the word of God and the preaching of the word of God and teaching us how we ought to live in the first place. Amen. The Christian walk is not a natural walk. Amen. You with me? It's not natural. It goes against everything your flesh wants. So you're gonna have to have somebody teach you how to walk differently. In the Bible is ours, the preaching is ours, but it's all brought to bear in our life by the presence of the Holy Ghost. He'll teach you. Then number two, he'll remind you. Look at verse number 26, I'm still there. He shall teach you all things. And then he said, he shall bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I've said unto you. Let me just shout for a minute. Say, thank God for the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. You say, preacher, I thought it was a Baptist church. It is. We've got the Holy Ghost. Somebody say amen right there. You say, hallelujah for the Holy Ghost. Why do you keep saying that, Brother Moore? Because there's somebody in me that reminds me of what I already knew. There's been many occasions in my walk with Christ that exceeds 45 years when I would have strayed after temptation, that I would have fallen in the snares of the devil, that I would have fallen prey to my own failures, and I knew better. But I forgot in the moment, in the heat of the temptation, I forgot. But thank God for the Holy Ghost. There was somebody that raised up inside of me and said, don't do it, don't do it. You say, well, that's your conscience. Honey, that conscience is a Disney film. It's not my conscience that I need. It's the Holy Ghost my conscience was seeing as though by a hot iron. I don't have a conscience that does me any good, but I got a Holy Ghost that'll make sure it's done well. The Holy Ghost reminds us. The Holy Ghost teaches us. The Holy Ghost reminds us. 
And then the Holy Ghost guides us, chapter number 16, verse number 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. I don't know if we have any DOT workers in here. I love you in the Lord. But it frustrates me to know when, when the DOT shuts down a road and they put the detour sign up. Detour, road closed. Okay. Detour, road closed. Okay. I get off. There's not another sign. I'm from out of town. The details is not on my map. My GPS is confused. The little woman inside of my phone that normally tells me what to do beside my wife does not know which direction to go. Y'all got one of those women in your phone? Amen. Preacher friend of mine said he bought for his Garmin, Tom Tom. He said, I bought one of those male voices. He said, I wasn't going to have two women in the town in the car telling me what to do. I'll just let that go. I'm not going there. I appreciate the fact, Brother Brandon, that the good workers at the DOT don't want me to go through the flood zone or the landslide. I'm grateful that where the big wreck is, four exits up, they've routed me off in the middle of some big metropolitan city. Thank you. <laughs> Quit laughing, Brother Greg. I know you've probably driven that truck in some of those. But when I get off, there's no additional resource. I, I'm simply on my own. I don't know which way to go to detour the problem. I'm not going through the problem, but I don't know which way to avoid the problem. I gotta get back on the road. I'm like, God, don't operate that way. The good Holy Ghost throws up the roadblock and hollers, stop! Don't go! The road's washed out! Avoid the snare. But then he reaches over and takes you by the hand. And he said, go this way. Let me guide you in this direction. This is how you avoid the situation. He'll guide you in all truth. Amen. By the way, the missing element in most Baptist churches is simple discernment. Amen. But if the discernment pulls away. Brother David, you did a great job this morning teaching out of the book of Jude. Stirred some thoughts up in my heart. Coming to a pulpit real soon. Amen. I'm going to tell you something. It's the work of the Holy Ghost in spiritual discernment that reaches up and pulls the mask off the wolves that are in sheep's clothing. It's the work of spiritual discernment that takes the flowery words of the false teacher and compares them to the unadulterated scriptures and said it's not right. It's not right. It's not right. It's the good work of the Holy Ghost that takes the appeal of, of, of a social gospel that doesn't make a change in the lifestyle of a man and shows you that's contrary to the teachings of the word of God. Amen. But oh, it's the same sweet Holy Ghost that said we're not gonna go after the wolf. We're not gonna pursue the false teaching. We're not gonna pursue the ways of the flesh. But here's truth. And that truth is a way of life. That truth is abundant living. That truth is a life worth living. That truth brings blessing and not a curse. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. There's, a, there's an affection that must be dealt with. Love the Lord. There's an action that must be dealt with. Obey his voice. And then there's an adoration that must be dealt with. The Holy Ghost wants me to finish. Verse 20, Deuteronomy 30. Thou mayest love the Lord thy God and that thou mayest obey his voice. And then he said that thou mayest, hallelujah, cleave unto him. Bible students, if I were to ask, there'd be somebody, shoot that hand up right away. Where's the other reference in our scriptures that talks about cleaving? Somebody shoot that hand up and take us to the book of Mark. Mark or Matthew. And we would hear the Lord Jesus, it's Matthew. We'd hear the Lord Jesus say, for this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave <laughs> unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh. 
Amen. Same word. He said that we may cleave. What an affectionate term. What an intimate term. What an endearing term. You see these first two thoughts we talked about. Love him. That's more than an emotion. But there's an emotional component of that. It's that warm fuzzy feeling. It's that tingle in your toes. But then he said obey him. That's that action. That's that get down in the dirt. Get your hands dirty kind of thing. But then he brings us into that intimacy. Then he brings us into that place, I call it adoration, where we cleave unto him. You know what that word means? Can't do without him. You South Carolinians will know this place. When Melissa and I were courting, she lived in North Carolina. I lived in Georgia. I was very active ministries, full-time evangelism, just like I am today, run all over the country. And so the time that we could see each other face-to-face was limited. <clears throat> now, remember, we is older. And so I would call her and I'd say, hey, I've got Saturday free. I don't have to leave for the meeting until 5 o'clock or whatever. I'd said, meet me. Sometimes we'd meet in Nashville because if I was preaching in Tennessee, she lived in the, the, the middle section, I guess, I-40 section of the state of North Carolina. She could be there in a couple hours. I could be there in a couple hours. We'd go to the mall, walk around, have dinner. The other place we always met was Gaffney. We'd eat at Fats Cafe under the Big Peach. Go to the outlet malls and walk around. We had thrilling, thrilling days. But it wasn't about what we were doing. It was about being together. And when we first started doing that, Brother David... We'd get done, I'd say goodbye, and I'd go on my way. And I thought that was fun. I enjoyed that. I can't wait to do that again. And then I'd pace up and down the wall. I'd pace up and down while she was filling up the car with gas, and I'd say, I don't really want her to leave. And I was debating in my mind, I believe this is the one God wants. What's God's timing? Done been down looking at engagement rings. Still battling that thing in my mind. How do you, I heard a fellow say one time, how do you wire a house when you don't turn off the power? I was, trying to take a, I was trying to take a young lady out of a normal daily routine. She taught school for a living and throw her in a ministry. Amen. That's exactly what we did. We got married on December 11th, went on our honeymoon, came back, enjoyed family Christmas for three or four days and left immediately on a six-week trip. Welcome to the, welcome to the married life. I've got all that pondering in my mind. I'm trying to figure all that timing out. I'm trying to see what God wants and all that. We had one of our meetings in Gaffney. Spent most of the afternoon together, eat at Fats Cafe together. Stopped at the gas station. We always did. Want to make sure she's gassed up. Make that two-hour drive, hour and 45-minute drive back to her house, and I had to leave. I said my goodbye. I was choked up, Brother Friedman. Big manly thing like me. I was choking back tears. Didn't want her to see me cry. And I got in the car and waved at her one last time. And she went north on 85 and I went south. And I thought I was going to have to pull off at the cow pence exit. Because I was crying so hard I couldn't see the road through my tears. And I said to myself, no more of this. Not going to live like this next time I'm taking her home. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> Put a ring on her finger and told her, let's say I do. Amen. You say, preacher, why did you say that? That's the idea of cleaving to something. Yeah. When you get to the place where you can't live without it. Yeah. And Jesus said, God said, if you want a blessed life, then have a relationship with him that's so rich and so full and so wonderful that you can't live without him and that you can't imagine a day when you don't walk in his fellowship and when you don't hold his hand and when he don't hold your hand and you're not in love with him because he's in love with you. We love him because he first loved us, but he loves us just because he loved us. Amen. Amen. He said, I love you because I love you. 
settled it. It's not because he saw something good in us. There wasn't nothing good to see. He's the only thing that is in me that's any good. He just loved me. Cleave unto him. Have an intimacy with him. Adore him. Understand you can't live without him. If I continue the marriage analogy, I'll make three statements. I'm done. We're finished. Number one, he completes us. Woo! I have found him that I was missing. That which was lacking in my life. He is what was missing. You testified I found what was missing. He completes you. How dare you live without that which completes you. Amen. Amen. He completes you. I'm going to tell you something else. He contents you. Amen. I charged a young couple yesterday standing in a church in Salisbury. I stood on a platform Bible in hand giving them charge. You know what I said? to that young man, I said, this day means you're not single anymore. Everybody laughed. There was a snigger over the entire congregation. I said, I'm not kidding. Because the problem I've seen in so many marriages that causes so much trouble is that young men and young ladies get married and they still act like they're single. They're more in tune with their friends and their families and their hobbits. Amen. What's a hobbit? It's a hobby and a habit mixed together. Amen. Then they are about their companion. I looked at him and I looked at her and I said, you're not single anymore. You got to live like a married couple. Amen. Say amen right there. Amen. Right? Now, I'm going to tell you, I enjoy the company of my friends. I enjoy the company of my family. I'm talking about my mother and my dad, even my sister and her family. I enjoy their company. But the thing that contents me is Melissa. Amen. 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 Oh, I get worried about Christian folk that are more content with what the world offers than with him. He's not coming over on your side, honey. You're going to have to come over to his. Amen. There's that which contents. Uh, are you satisfied? Does he satisfy you? Are you are you satisfied with Jesus? Number three, and I'm done. This analogy of marriage means that he completes me. Number two, he contents me. And number three, he's my companion. He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. He goes with me every step of the way. I say to my children sometimes if we've had a disciplinary day and they come way, way too often. There's been a division of fellowship. We're, we're not in agreement with each other. And there's been, there's been disciplinary actions and difficult situations. And sometimes in the very same day, Brother Freeman, that'll clear up. And in the afternoon, they're as good as angels. And I don't even know if angels are good, but y'all know what I mean. I have a favorite expression. I don't think either one of them's got it. But I say to them, I said, isn't life a whole lot better like this? It in life a whole lot better like this. If you're walking in his will, working in his, in his field, and living according to his word, oh, how sweet the fellowship is. Brother Corey, I want you to come help me if you don't mind. Just a minute, come up here. I'm done. I'm, I'm trying to finish. Now, if Brother Corey represents Mr. Christian and I represent the Holy Ghost, the Lord Jesus, if you will, it's all right to say that. They're inseparable, yet they are separate. <laughs> Here's what the Bible said. When I got saved, when Mr. Corey, when Mr. Christian got saved, the Holy Ghost took up his abode in his life in his ever present. He will never Y'all got that right? He will never leave him. He will never forsake him. Nowhere you could go, he won't be with you. Y'all agree with that, don't you? Amen. Amen. And so 
If I'm the Holy Ghost who Corey's Mr. Christian since he got saved, we walk side by side. If Mr. Corey goes this way, the Holy Ghost is going this way. If Mr. Corey goes this way, the Holy Ghost is going this way. Because there is a companion for the journey. Amen. Amen. Y'all got that. That's not new theology. Let me tell you what this, this, this book teaches us. Here's how, here's how we respond to the Holy Ghost. Now, Mr. Corey, I just want you to walk. Just walk straight down through here. And I'm walking and I say, hey, don't go over there. He throws that arm up. Wait a minute, wait a minute, just wait a minute. He just throws that arm up. Stop! Not interested! Well, I'm not leaving. I'm the Holy Ghost. You can't get along without me. But here's what he does. He does like some of your children did. He just ignores me. Oh, I'm still there. Just move this way. Just keep looking that way. He said... I'm not looking over there. I'm not going to fellowship with you. I'm going to ignore the very fact you're there. And yet, the Holy Ghost is the one that fulfills him, contents him, satisfies him, blesses him. And he ignores him. I don't want to do that. I want to choose well. He said it's serious. Thank you, Brother Corey. He said it's serious. It's going to affect heaven and earth. It's sobering. It's life or death. You'll be dead while you live if you choose wrong. Right. Amen. It affects others. Your children are impacted. Your grandchildren are impacted. Your neighbors are impacted. There's a reward if you choose well. You'll have life and longevity and possess the land, the blessings. You can dwell in it. But you'll have to choose well. He said to do that, it's real easy, but so hard. Love the Lord thy God. Obey his voice. And then when you're walking beside him, don't turn like this. Turn like this and cleave to him. When I was a boy preacher, I'd preach in Rock Mart, Georgia. Sister, let's go to piano for an old preacher named George Robinson. And uh, <laughs> it wasn't so much that Brother George believed in, in uh, going, not going out on Sunday. There just wasn't nowhere to go. So we'd have dinner. We'd always go back to the preacher's house. Sister Robinson always had big dinner made. A little old farm. He lived out in the country. He had a prize apple tree. And on several occasions, he'd take me out and show me that apple tree. His apple tree was a prize apple tree because it was an old apple tree that grew multiple varieties. Now, I don't remember the varieties, and some of you arborists probably could be more efficient at giving that illustration. But for sake of illustration, this trunk of this tree would have one branch that produced red delicious and another branch that produced wine saps and another branch that produced golden delicious. It produced multiple varieties. And I said, how'd that happen? He said, well, he said, there was a day when I went over and took the branch off of a good tree. He said, I cut that branch off. It's interesting, every time you find that word cleaving, he talks about leaving. For this cause shall a man leave. You can't cleave until you leave. Somebody say amen right there. And he took a branch off of a good tree, and he brought that branch over, and he said it, it, it was a painful experience because he said I had to peel back the bark certain section. And he said that's what I did to that new branch that's going to be put in. And then he said, watch this, Brother David, he said I had to make a cut in the trunk of the existing tree. And he said it had to be deep enough that I got where the sap was. He said it had to bleed. <laughs> and he said, I made a deep incision into the trunk of that tree. And he said when the sap began to run, I knew I was deep enough. And he said then I inserted that piece off of that, old, off that other tree, that new branch. He said I inserted it in that wound. And he said in time it healed up. 
And he said, now that new branch grows because it gets its life from that trunk. And some of you have been saved by the grace of God, but your life still comes from the world and the things that are in the world. And what God wants to do is cut you off and insert you in him, in the wounds of his soul, and allow you to start drawing your sustenance from Jesus. And when he becomes what satisfies you and contents you and gives you life, then you can say, my life is a blessing. I chose well. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed.